I love singing and dancing. Hi, you folks. You looking for some rotten cotton? I'm a woman. That's okay. Yeah, that's even better. Got a good time for you. <laughs> you two are the most decorated officers in this department. What do you say? Looks like a robbery gone wrong to me. This wasn't a robbery. This was a hit. Welcome. Someone out there <gasps> is killing puppets. Carrie. What? Have a little respect for the dead. I miss lunch. <laughs> We are going to have some fun tonight. Welcome to the film board from the next reel on rashpixel.fm. We spoil movies, and this month we had jumped right into the raunch of the Happy Time Murders, a godforsaken comedy that puts puppets in all kinds of terrible and totally inappropriate situations for those folks that are faint of heart. Comedy is not the most common genre for us to dive deep into on this show, so let's knock the fuzz off this thing <laughs> and get into it with our hosts. How are you feeling, Tommy Handsome? Great! Thank you for having me. <laughs> what about you, Andy Nelson? I have been drinking maple syrup all night just to be ready for this. <laughs> Tasty. These guys call me JJ, and before we get gabbing, check out more about our fun film family at thenextreel.com. Join us in our vibrant movie community. We're always looking for more kooky cousins. Okay, we made a bit of a de- departure here for this one, guys. What did you think about it? What are your initial thoughts from the Happy Time Murders? Andy. I am a big Melissa McCarthy fan. I think that she's uh, she's hilarious. She's great at kind of, uh, you know, raunchy comedy. She's great uh, portraying kind of just a, a totally different sense of <laughs> of a female than you normally get in films. Like she's she's not afraid to just go down crazy roads. And I think that's great. Mm. And it's fun to watch. Um, I also really love the Muppets and I love uh, what what uh, Team Henson does uh, over there. Unfortunately, I I think in this particular case, I, I'm not going to fault it as a blending between the two. I don't think it's the fault of of finally Melissa McCarthy and the and the Muppets are working together, and this is what we get. <laughs> I just think it's I, I I'm going to just really put put it in the hands of uh, Brian Henson, um, and say that uh, you know I I think that he was looking for a way to express himself. Uh, as as we saw at the beginning of this, there's a. Uh, this is under a a, a uh, company uh, logo, HA, hence an alternative. Yeah. And uh, I think they were trying to do something a little different, and I think it was a, a big flat fail. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> and hence an alternative. This is like their third project or something. Is it really? Uh, yeah, it's it's it, there's not a whole lot to it. Henson Alternative was made uh, specifically to target uh using the Henson properties for adults. So, we can get a little bit more into that later too. Uh that's interesting that you tagged that with the punctuation of failure. Tommy, Tommy, how did you feel about the movie? <laughs> um I <laughs> I really wanted to like this movie. <laughs> and I do yeah. think that there are is a place for puppets with doing adult things, obviously, with things like old things like Meet the Feebles, but current things, currenter things like Avenue Q and the late great show Wonder Chosen, which was one of my favorite things in the entire world. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of possibility for this film, and I think they spent their time on the wrong things, and unfortunately, it just really missed i loved certain parts of it there were a couple times when i thought it was hysterical but mainly those little moments showed me how much promise the film had that it really just didn't deliver well i think that's interesting too because you know i was really excited for this movie too and i i you say you really wanted to like it i was really hoping that i liked it because the trailer was great I mean, honestly, I, I made the statement trailer. in our Discord channel. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I laughed more at the trailer. I had more fun with the trailer for this movie than I've had from a trailer for a long, long time. That being said, it kind of set the stage for everything, right? I mean, there were a few times that I laughed outside the trailer, but it was maybe three. I think I can pick up three in particular. Mm. Otherwise, the big hits were all the trailer hits. Uh, they they made a great trailer for this movie, but did they leave everything else on the table? I mean, I don't know. They, they, we don't talk about comedy very often on this show. And so what 
what makes a comedy worth it for us to go out and see in the theater? What What is it for you guys? What's the What's the deciding point that says I'm going to go see that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think a funny trailer, you know, says a lot, and obviously having having key elements in there. And in this particular case, I mean, I had some issues with the trailer. I I thought just from watching the trailer that it was already going a little too far down down one particular track, which was basically sex jokes. You know, let's take puppets yeah. and put them in a, a movie full of sex jokes. And uh, the bit with the cheese whiz, uh, you know, that there was plenty of that in the trailer. And that's the point in the trailer. I'm like, oh, he might be crossing into Meet the Feebles territory and just going down Wait, cheese whiz. the wrong you, you road. You mean Silly, silly string, string, right? Silly String, sorry. <laughs> cheese whiz, Silly String. <laughs> What film? Isn't that what you guys put makes it a completely no, different no, see, thing? I, what I, films have you I been put... working on, Andy? <laughs> what kind of did you just use? I use silly with? string. On... <laughs> silly string is what goes on all of my Philly cheesesteaks. Oh no! Hey, Andy, you're really <laughs> sick. When I'm playing with the kids. I use <laughs> cheese with. You need to go to the hospital right now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, you're my. right. I mean... Yeah, it's 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 you know it just it, it's problematic, and unfortunately, I think. We, you know, because of, of films like Deadpool that have really kind of, uh, mm. amped things up with what you can do in an R rated comedy and really, well, I shouldn't even just say that. I mean, just going to the hangover and I mean, even more recently, Tag, I think had a, a lot of funny stuff going on in it for an R rated comedy. And you can find things to do in it that aren't necessarily just devolving into the basest form of humor, which is sex jokes. And I think there's plenty of sex jokes in the Deadpool movies, too, but they find ways to make a lot of other things funny, too. And that's the problem with this. And in doing something with the detective story, I'm like, gosh, you know, they could have found ways to have so much more fun with this. And... And this is all they're giving us. And it was really a big frustration for me. Yeah, I felt that it didn't go far enough. And I think maybe my table has been set in a different place because of the movies that you're talking about, about Deadpool specifically, right? I expected that level of consistent shock, uh, shock comedy from the jokes. And I never really got that. I didn't even feel like there were a whole lot of even sex jokes. And that's not what I was looking for, but I was looking to, for it to take it further. I don't think it's possible in a raunchy comedy to take it too far. I think you can only, uh, I think you can only take it not far enough. And I think that's what this movie did for me in that those best stuff that shocked me and made me laugh. Uh, it made me laugh uncontrollably, I guess, or or yeah. made me laugh to the point where I was I was really into it. We're in the trailer. The other stuff was just more uh, some clever kicks here and there, but I I was looking for them to take it further. I. I, I think they should have taken the gloves off. I think they should have gone further, whether it was with sex jokes or other jokes. I, I just didn't see it from this movie. I agree. And I wonder if part of the problem, and this is, I'm just coming up with this theory right now, live, this is exciting, is um, <laughs> S- Melissa McCarthy is an interesting choice for this movie because in the movies where she's very much in control, especially movies that are directed by her husband, Ben Falcone... Does that sound right? Yeah. Uh, why, why, why do I know his name and no one else's name? Um, and who and he's also <laughs> he has a cameo in the movie. That so much of the humor is based on clearly riffing on the set. That there, that's why it has that nervous kind of feeling. Uh, films like Spy, yeah. where they're like every they do what's clearly on the page, and then there's like three to four back and forths, and it's always about what hat they're wearing or what kind of thing they're doing right then. I wonder if maybe that's really hard to do with puppets. <laughs> To be able to Probably. well, to be able to make Especially up that ki- uh, yeah, uh, to be able to make that kind of riffing linearama situation, maybe that's too hard to do with puppets. Maybe I don't know how puppets work. Well, and also Melissa McCarthy, uh, you know, does a great job of kind of being the uh, not necessarily the straight man, and and I, I, you know, it's it's an interesting relationship between her. And and her uh, partner in this, uh, which I, I guess it's. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say that he's he's the funny man and she's the straight man. I, I guess I'm not quite sure if either of them are really <laughs> I thought, fully I thought the, he was the, the straight the, man, and that was actually a big problem I had with the movie. Well, but she's not exactly the the funny man either. I mean, I guess there are times where it goes off the rails, you know, where like she's she's uh, you know they're forcing her to give her all the pink, purple sugar or right. whatever it is. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. And I, I think that's, that's part of it is they, they didn't find a good way to blend the, rela- blend these characters where I actually really kind of, uh, found either of them fully, uh, 
fully formed mm-hmm. in in the way that they should be in a comedy. And so I, for me, it all falls on the shoulders of the of the screenwriters and Todd Berger, who wrote this, um, along with uh, D. Austin Robertson, who uh, came up with the story with him. I just felt like they did not know how to handle a script uh, of this level and, and find the comedy that they needed to mine in it. My question is, how important is the story, really? I mean, we can talk about the relationship between Melissa McCarthy and and her partner, which is Phil Phillips, right? This, mm-hmm. this yeah. the the puppet that is is trying to be a cop, trying to normalize his existence. But it, when I go to a pure comedy, and not everybody's like this, but I'm looking for something really, really absurdist. And honestly, like the more departure from the story, the happier I am. The the more uh, comedic, the more laughs I'm going to get in a, in in a movie. And I think you know. You brought up The Hangover earlier, something like that or something like uh, There's Something About Mary or, you know, one of these movies that just really just doesn't have uh, have any point where they feel that they need to come back to the story. They're going to just depart from the story to make something terribly absurdist. That's the best kind of comedy to me. So, I mean, my question to mm-hmm. you guys is how important is the story how, when you're when you're writing, when you're when you're making a comedy? Honestly, it, my my opinion is let go of the story. It doesn't matter about their relationship as cops. Get rid of it. I, I don't need you to balance it. Just give me more laughs. Give me more craziness uh, how well, do you guys balance it and what you do huh. you say that but I, I i think that um that's that might not uh, well i don't want to say it's not giving credit to to the actual writers who are really putting a lot of work into projects like the hangover um although i think it is but i think what what really uh, shines in in what you're saying is just how how skilled those writers have to be in comedy especially to actually make that stuff seem so transparent that it just feels like it's it's completely natural and and that's what i think is really working well in a film like the hangover which also has incredible writing because the the way that film is structured is so clever like in the puzzle. way that it's yeah yeah it's yeah. it's it's one of the most brilliantly structured comedies that we've had in in you know the last uh, decade or two i just think it's it's an ingenious story the way that they put that together and it, with this I, I think per- you're right and with this particular film, not only is the comedy writing sloppy, but just the story of the structure of the story is yeah. just really kind of very base and and flat. And the fact that it ends up being this little girl whose father had been killed. I mean, it's like, oh, this is all of a sudden going down a really dark road that I don't <laughs> like where we're headed with it. This is this makes me uncomfortable that this is how we're ending this. It, it just turned into a really dark and uncomfortable ending. That was just it just it was never built into something that congealed in a way that an effective screenplay should. I personally didn't mind that it turned out to be the little girl because that gave, that gave me um, a thought that there was actually like a real through line as far as story for me that, that I also uh, want to bring up is that if you're going to ape a style in this, they're aping noir films and buddy cop films. So I think that in order to have the absurdism work or the craziness work, absurdism is a little bit different um, that you need to set the table in a familiar and very sort of reality drenched way, I feel. Um, And so that's why I think for comedies, like to go back to your uh, original question, um, JJ story is important in that. I think it's very important that you care about the characters and it's very important that you care about the stakes because if you don't have those things, and I think it's important to have some heart, but a lot of comedies very much, and especially um, uh, Judd Apatow, some of his go way too far, I think. And when he has, I think he has the longest third acts in history <laughs> that it's never like he has to make up with what the hero doesn't have to make up with one person. He, she has to make up with nine and it just goes on and on and on that. I think I agree with you, JJ. I just sort of want to get to it. And that's why I want to fast forward through that stuff. But I think that the story is very important and it didn't set up. I mean, to go to what I was just talking about, about the noir thing, it was so, I felt unfortunately lazily filmed that maybe so much attention was spent on the puppets that it never really looked like noir. At times, the music made it sound like noir. The Phil Phillips, um, whatchamacallit, voiceover has noir touches. And the fact that it all, it's two different crimes that become one. They had the chance at it, but it never looks or sounds like what it was going for. And so the whole thing just comes off, like you said, very flat. 
if you want to see a great uh, noir uh, comedy that is uh, in this vein, look at a film that this clearly also is aping, which is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Ah, you beat me to it. Ah, <laughs> That's sorry. exactly what I was going to say. I too. was going to say the help. <laughs> 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 no but you're right though because they do hit the right tone with the noir stuff in who yep. framed roger rabbit when when it's appropriate yeah. and then they jump between the worlds in a very appropriate and interesting way in who framed roger rabbit as well this this was a cheap ape of that it, which i would have been okay with if the if the absurdist or the zany stuff would have gone far enough right from a comedy perspective but i wasn't laughing enough to say that's okay it's a little too it feels a little too self-satisfied for just a puppet using the f word is enough that that's shocking enough that the rest can all take a back seat and unfortunately that's just not true that would have been true maybe a decade ago I don't even know that because, I mean, you look at what, uh, I mean, I mentioned earlier, Meet the Feebles that uh, Peter Jackson did in, in 1989. Oh, whoa. And, right. and that was, that was essentially, 1989. It? <laughs> yeah, it was wow. 1989. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I mean, it's, it's a similar, I think at that time he was really just riffing more off of straight from the Muppets, uh, because it's a group of puppets who are all a stage troupe. And I mean, oh, they're okay. just, uh, I mean, they're just a, a terrible bunch of people right. and it's, it's full of all sorts of, nonsense and it's unfortunately become kind of a cult film because of you know his successes afterward but it's terrible but it's it's exactly just going after base humor that is quote-unquote funny just because it's puppets team america right. world police is another movie to bring up because that realized where it was but then elevated everything about it the writing yeah there's a the, great example the making fun of the limitations of puppets at times the story was crazy was i mean it was unafraid to go wherever i mean yeah that's that's them knowing it's not just funny enough to have puppets say things that are dark that you have to the people will jive with that in the first five minutes well and now i, I don't want to I, I don't want to point a finger at this because i have no idea if this is why it is but that could be because we're dealing with the henson group here Right. I mean, honestly, there is a self-awareness of being part of the Henson legacy that probably only allows you to go so far when you're going this this the, to something raunchy like this. We talked about Henson Alternative. This ha with an exclamation mark was created for uh, for adult style puppetry, which we have talked about a lot of different examples of where it's worked and, and where we've seen it recently at the website that they have at Henson dot com slash Henson dash alternative. They have featured productions. Now, I said they only have three. There's only three that are actually here on the website. We've got Happy Time Murders, which is current. There's a show called No You Shut Up on TV. Have either oh, of you guys seen that? Yeah, that's uh, Paul F. Tompkins. It's like a it's a parody of like a news show. Gotcha. Okay. Is it good? It was. It was very good. Yes. Oh, it's it's over now. Okay, gotcha. It's not running. Correct. But then and then they have a stage show uh, along the lines of Avenue Q, right? Which is called Puppet Up, right. uh, uncensored. So I don't know about that. And th these might. I said they only have. Three. They may have other things going too. But um, but these are the only things featured on the website. They. I guess my point about it is, you know, you talk about Team World America, World Police, and 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 taking it to that next step, and taking about the limitations of puppetry. I think that probably when you talk about the Henson legacy that would be the, the limitations of puppetry is something that they would probably be uncomfortable exploring in any medium i would assume does that does that seem to ring true for you guys well they've certainly they they've expanded the world of puppetry as far as what you can do with puppetry and in that sense i i think there is some interesting stuff that they did here with green screen and uh basically creating a whole world of puppets where you didn't have uh, you didn't have the wires. You didn't have uh, shots that were designed in such a way where you couldn't see below their knees. So because the puppeteers were under them, I mean, they still had those, but they had a lot of like world building shots where it was just puppets crossing the street and puppets doing things. And to that end, I was actually pretty impressed with some of the puppet work. Now, I always feel a little I don't know if, if uh, cheated is the right word, but maybe where I see a, like a green screen puppet just doing stuff because I know, well, it's, you know. How is that different than any other special effects? What I think is interesting about puppetry is the fact that the person's there, but they're designing things in a way where I can't see them. Mm. But in here, where you see the actual puppet uh, crossing the street, sometimes I do feel a little bit, well, it's kind of cheating a little bit, but yeah, I don't know. Still, that being said, um, I think they do a great job with that end of things uh, as far as the puppetry. I just, I wish that there were other things that 
that uh, made it uh, worthwhile. But, you know, I will say to that, and I, they, they, there was a great puppet gag that I thought was actually really funny. And that's when the little kid puppets or the kids, the human boys steal the puppet's eye. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. was just something that I thought was actually really clever. It's like something that, uh, you know, young punk kids would do to a puppet. Uh, let's take his eye. And it just, it just <laughs> seemed so awful. Um, but it, it worked and it played in, in this world. So they, they found ways to play with stuff like that, 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 you know, worked in, in some capacity. That's fair. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, I think that the, the most effective uh, point about this for me is that maybe, uh, you know, my view of looking for something really absurdist and really kind of off script or out, out of the story is maybe best explained by really good writers who actually make it and interweave it into their script. Well, like you talked about in examples of The Hangover and things like that. I think, I think for me that, that that's where this movie felt flat is that they were spending so much time in the box with what they had that I didn't get any sort of that masterful writing about what they could do from a comedy perspective uh, with uh, whether it was talking about the limitations of puppetry or what they could do outside of those limits. I feel like there was one punch-up writer who is unsung that every once in a while he or she would sort of poke their head up in this movie and was my favorite parts. Uh, the It's funny that you brought up that scene, um, Andy, because the first time that I laughed out loud, part of it was the editing it was also something that was off screen, so something that they could have added later. But it's after they steal his eye and Phil Phillips punches him in the face. And that guy and the same guy is so happy. And he's like, I just want to sing and dance. And this is what I do. And then as Phil Phillips is laboriously entering his office, you just hear him say, hey, can you spare a penny? My wife is dead. And I thought that was hysterical because <laughs> he said it in such that a happy really way. Funny. That's great. Right. There's a whole misunderstanding situation of... Um, what people are saying when they're giving each other quiet uh, remarks before like invading a room and stuff, which was really fun. There was some, there's like some of the writing was actually very, felt very young, felt very vital and very interesting. And then there was um, a runner of a hole says what, and that's insane. Or yeah. like the FBI meaning effing big idiot effing or something, big idiot. and like that's going back over uh, and over. I mean, like that. What it was that it wasn't makes funny. me feel like at time like did at one point was it were they looking for a PG thirteen option or something because that's Maybe. such base level writing that doesn't match the tentacle porn with the co with the cow. <laughs> someone in there really <laughs> want someone in there was punching hard, and then the rest of it is just very pedestrian, which is a shame. Well, I felt like the, you know, I, I got a really big laugh, uh, when they were, uh, trying to get the file out of, I, I think probably my, my favorite, uh, character, uh, named Ronovan Scargle. <laughs> that, that has to be the, the most odd name I've ever heard. But they're trying to steal the file out of his office and she's trying to distract him and trying to get Phil oh, to right. take the file. And finally, Phil just picks up this ball and just clocks him in the head. Yep. I did laugh that, at that. That yeah. came out of nowhere and that actually worked really well. And then the ball jokes actually, <laughs> that like that, there were moments in there that actually I, were pretty effective. But again, going back to the fact that they were struggling with the script, like that's a character thread that I'm like, I kind of wish that somehow that character ended up coming back because they stole these contracts. I would have liked to have seen kind of a return to that. But yeah, that and Ronovan was played by uh, Michael McDonald. Yes. Do you guys know Michael McDonald? He's in the movie. Uh, right. Oh, he's, oh uh, he, that's the human's name? I thought you meant that was the yes. puppet's name. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, JJ, he's an actor. See, actors yes. are pretend people in... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, well he's, he's been in a lot of it, different things. That's what, yeah. I guess that's why... I, but I, he's I, quite a number with uh, Melissa McCarthy, actually. So right. I, I don't know if it's you know something that she brings him along or what. I think they but, grew up uh, together in the improv circuit. I mean, his IMDb is all about groundlings and, and whatnot and in LA stuff. So I think they were in the groundlings together. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. He's, he's kind of like a comedic character actor in that when you see a bunch of the, the different people he's played, you'll be like, Oh, I recognize that character, but right. what do I know that character from? He's probably most right, famous right. for mad TV would be my guess. Uh, and what was the character that he played on Mad TV? He played, he played this kind of like a kid, this little kid, thing? kind of like that Martin short that movie was, who was a real little stinker. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time i've ever said a real little stinker out loud <laughs> you're welcome america <laughs> uh we talked a little bit about melissa mccarthy how'd you think she did in this movie her best i 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think she did her best. I think um, oh, there, that's what you meant when you said her best. I was like, oh, you think this is the best? Oh, yeah, no, movie? I she, really? I think she elevated a lot of it. I think she was dying. I mean, she came to life in that scene when she was hopped up on purple schniz. Um, <laughs> and that was one of my favorite one parts of her is when she kept drug inducedly repeating the exact same thing to her captain. I yeah. thought that was really funny. Oh yeah. No, I like that too. Yeah. That I thought great. that was that whole that whole run was really fun because it was liberating for her. For her, I know I think we've gone back and forth on who was the straight person. Uh but uh she spent a lot of the movie kind of restricted. Yeah, I always felt she was better when she wasn't with Phil. Like when they split up and she's actually looking for uh gumbo or whatever that little thing's Goofer. name was. Goofer. When she's looking for Goofer, that to me was uh, also more of her better stuff when she's you know in that uh, slum house looking <laughs> looking for him and finding him and having that conversation with Goofer. Yeah. So that's that's when she was doing her best. Yeah, well that that's why I had to make the the clarification because when you said her best, I was like, oh really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Banks shows up. Uh, she was part of the Happy Time Gang and then uh, ended up as a as an entertainer. A stage entertainer. Um, I I thought it was clever for her. I thought she was great. I didn't find her funny, but I, I liked her her role in this movie. Me too. She played it pretty straight, which is needed for that kind of role, especially when you're talking to puppets and having bizarre third act uh, <laughs> twists come out. Uh, and so I thought she was a lot of fun. That's the problem is, is, you know, she does well with what she's given, but nothing about her part is written well. And it's, it's so frustrating that mm. it just falls down so many, uh, holes that are just so straightforward in just very low level comedies like this. Well, I think this, uh, goes back to that point about trying to figure out who the straight man is in this. I think maybe it's natural for us to assume the human is always the straight person because their character in, in the Muppets universe, right? Their character is meant to be a, a human style character where the, we have the sort of lack of limitations to the puppet. The puppet can be anything that we want it to be. Um, but I think that the best parts of this movie was when we let, when the movie let the actors get free of that straight person persona and allow them to be a little bit more wild and crazy and comedic. And that never was the case with Elizabeth Banks, unfortunately. Mm. Um, and we had that rarely with Melissa McCarthy. I think you could say the same about the other actors here too. Maya Rudolph, she had a character to play and her stuff was, I, th I, I love Maya Rudolph. I thought she was great in this movie, but there wasn't I thought much, she was fantastic. There wasn't much for her to do, right? No, but she was, she found a way to elevate it in a way that Elizabeth Banks wasn't able to just with sure. little character choices and facial expressions and stuff. She's really, she was, she was sort of the MVP for me in this movie. Well, she was given more to work with than Elizabeth was, I think. Very much so. Leslie David Baker, we know him from The Office, right? Lieutenant Banning. Oh, right. Uh, again, again, really wasn't doing much. He was, again, a straight guy against everything that the puppets were doing or the people interacting with the puppets were. Yeah, it's just, it's more of just his character from The Office as the as the lieutenant you know there right. really wasn't much more to him unfortunately that's I, yeah, that's that's my problem with most of the the human characters is they didn't give them much to do they didn't give them much to work with well and joel McHale, i love i no. love joel McHale. Yeah. i watch all of his stuff literally anything that comes up on netflix i love his brand of comedy i love his style mm -hmm. he was completely flat in this movie like there was almost no purpose to cast him in this movie was there well, there's no purpose to his character. Like the FBI right. comes in, but then they just kind of blow it all off at the end. I'm like, what, what was the FBI here for in the first place? It was just, it was so poorly written. Everything involving the FBI bit just really just, it was only to put Phil on the run. And that was just, they didn't need it. They really had to burn through those awesome a-hole says what jokes. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was How the only many, reason and, he was there. <laughs> yep. And and we talked about a little bit in the pre-show about making old old tropes for a new audience. Do you think the whole a hole says what joke is something that we did in elementary school and junior high, and that they're trying to let the young kids know that that is here now? I mean, like why why that I joke? Don't, it it, it oh, actually it's... seems like I have a conspiracy theory about it that that was actually come up with on the set. That that was something that they just sort of did that Melissa McCarthy and uh, Bill Beretta did, and it just sort of became something. But no, it doesn't make sense because there's because it's two shots. They're cutting away to Joel McHale 
in complicated shots saying what. So no, that my theory sucks. I don't know. It's just so lazy. <laughs> I'm desperately trying to give it a reason to exist. They would have to do it in this like improv way where they refuse to stonewall, so they actually add additional jokes in there for it. Right. And, and that doesn't improve the quality of the bad joke. No. I mean, I, I think that's the beauty of improv, right? When you see it on stage, you run with it, and then when it fails, you move on. And they didn't, definitely didn't do it with that stuff in this movie because they you know, had, no, had no audience to judge. Part of it, I'm just looking at uh, Todd Berger, who yeah, who's was credited Todd as the screenwriter here. So <laughs> looking at his writing, I mean, mostly, aside from a lot of shorts, um, a lot of stuff that he's done is for kids. Kung Fu Panda, Secrets of the Furious Five, which was uh, one of the straight-to-video shorts for the Kung Fu Panda films. The Smurfs, yeah. A Christmas Carol, Kung Fu Panda, Secrets of the Masters. I, I feel like huh. they... They grabbed him. I mean, he's he's done some other things. Like he did that that film, It's a Disaster, which was like uh, a bunch of uh, I think it was a bunch of couples getting together for brunch to find out that the world's ending. Oh yeah, I saw that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that was kind of an indie film that that he was involved in. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, it's I don't know. Just looking at his stuff, I'm like, ah, was he really the right guy to come on board to write this? Interesting. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. He would write the PG-13 version. He would, it seems like looking at, I'm looking at him too, he would write the A-hole says what version. Yeah, yeah maybe. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, it, there's there's only him listed as the writer of the screenplay. There's a story by credit there too with the name, uh, let's see here, uh, what's her name? Uh, with uh, D. Austin Robertson as the story by, uh, along with Todd Berger, but nobody else listed as maybe punch-up writers that we talked about, you know, that conspiracy theory earlier. But it'd be interesting to see uh, everybody that was in the room for that with, of course, Brian Henson directing. So, um, yeah, it's it's the, the, the story back of if you're going going to go all the way in a raunchy comedy you might need to get someone who's you know willing to get out of the pg-13 realm for it i think and apart from because i know that we're really coming down on the writing but unfortunately i feel the need to <laughs> also come down on the director a bit um oh. i just didn't oh yeah i just yeah. didn't believe the world it looked it looked it looked like how if you the whole thing looked rushed like there was no time, but I think that this has been an incredibly long passion project for him. I thought I read that somewhere uh, for Mr. Um, Henson that um, but everything looked like they had two takes to sort of get it and they had really didn't have time to set up things. I just wonder if the preparing for puppets is so exhausting and so time consuming that all of the uh, attention went on to that and, you know, everything else just sort of left behind. Because it just didn't look good. I feel that, you know, if you look at other Muppet movies that Brian Henson has been involved in, um, I definitely feel that. Like, uh, going back to stuff where he did, um, like Muppet Treasure Island or Muppet Christmas Carol, um, I, I feel like it always feels a little TV-ish where it's mm -hmm. like the way the camera positions are. It's never anything that, that helps sell uh, in an interesting way. And I think it's very basic. And I think if he had found a way to like co-direct it with somebody who could help bring the world to life, make it a little more noirish, yes. et cetera, et cetera, and he could kind of handle the puppet side of things, I think that would have lent a lot to making this, um, at least in that capacity, work better than it did. Yeah, because I mean, again, as I said before, and I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but if you're doing any kind of a satire or a parody of something, you need all of that stuff to be on lock. Like the way of like hire hire from like serious people that have that did like kiss kiss bang bang or something. They should be your crew, and then the writers are the ones that blow it up. Yeah, um, right. Uh, but no, I, I kept forgetting that it was a noir. Right. Yeah. It was it's, so it's, bright. Yeah. It's you never get that so inside. Yeah. yeah. Well, and if we're talking about the world, like we never. I, I don't. Th I agree with you about what you've said about the recent Muppet movies, but uh, you never feel that way about the original Muppet movies, which, of course, you know, were a different crew set up for that. But those were the original Muppet movie, for example, it's such a great world, and you never feel like you're in the fakeness of. They, they never feel the need to explain the world of Muppets existing alongside humans, and that they just make it. It's you're just living in it, and I think that's kind of nice in the original stuff. I would say, though, that like the Muppets um, and even Muppets most wanted to a certain extent, 
I mean, even those I felt like had a little bit, well, maybe more of the Muppets than the Muppets most wanted had a little better uh, sense of things than uh, what Brian Henson did when he was doing Muppets uh, Christmas Carol and and Muppet Treasure Island, Mm. which, you know, I just, I I don't know. I I never felt like he was a strong director. um, And uh, I, I felt like other people could helm better than than he and so when i saw that he was directing this i'm like oh well, that's interesting i wonder if he'll be able to pull something more interesting off this time i i think i think we're all on the same page about that how did you feel about the muppets in, in the muppet characters in in particular phil phillips bill beretta did, did how did he come off for you as a character i actually liked uh the characters i i liked the the idea of these characters i liked the the characters from the tv show i thought phil worked as kind of this this you know this kind of uh down on his luck um uh detective and uh i thought that it was nice and bill beretta i mean he's been around with the muppets for quite a long time i mean he's been um uh, a number of characters going back um for for uh, decades now and to that end i think hmm. he's tapped into that um, but, um, I don't know. I, I, I didn't, I, I, my fault that I have is not with any of the, the voice per- performances or the, or, or largely the actors. I think everybody's doing the best they can with it. I think it's just the script, but I, I, I like what he's bringing to the table as, as Phil. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think at times I felt he was a little too passive, um, that having him be the straight man for me, who I decided was the straight man, um, uh, brought the film down a bit because we spend so much time with him, but he would make sense if the rest of the movie was at a higher level because then he would be the grounding character. If the rest of the movie is a little bit bland and a little bit flat, then for me, I'm just realizing now that was the reason that I found him to be a little bit boring, but he was probably designed to be the grounding character in an insane world. Unfortunately, the world was just a little bit bland. So yeah, I agree with Andy. Yeah, I think, you know, and uh, I th- I think that's the same with maybe all the characters as we look at it. It doesn't have to be separated into puppets and not. But I will say we we've talked negatively about about uh, Brian Henson and his influence on the movie, but I the crab in the one scene that the crab had was one of my favorite puppets in the entire movie. I thought it was very funny. <laughs> that was one of the times that I actually laughed the hardest was was when the crab came in. So I'll give Brian Henson that credit maybe. Uh, what did you like about there. that so much? I don't know. I that's the thing. A lot of the a lot of the comedy it wasn't a transcendent comedy for me in this. There wasn't a whole lot of things that I was laughing at that I was going to remember when I left the film. In, in fact, when you talk about the scene with Michael McDonald earlier where he got knocked out by Phil, I forgot that I liked that scene uh, because none of the stuff made me laugh for an extended amount of time. That's but so funny. The crab I, don't remember, the I don't remember the crab. That's wh- uh, where was the when crab? Melissa McCarthy walks up on, on the, the beach. beach oh, and on talks Venice to Beach, the... right? That's right. Yes, yeah. that's right. And the crab is there. Yeah, I, I, just the little. I mean, there were one-off laughs yep. in this movie, uh, and they yes. they showed up every so often. And I think it has a lot to do with that sort of that 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 kind of writing that you were talking about, Tommy, earlier, where it's like every so often you'd get a little bit of a, a crazy streak in it that 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 towed the line to the absurdist thing that I think that, that uh, definitely that I was looking for when I came to this movie, but it only came up a couple times and, uh, and the crab was one of them for me. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, I see Andy, did you add uh, Christopher Leonard's here, uh, in terms of music? Uh, yeah, I, I, I like Christopher Leonard's. I think that he's actually, uh, <laughs> you know, poor Christopher, he's done a lot of music for, some lower end uh, films and some lower comedies and stuff, but I think that he brings it. And in general, I think there were elements. It, it wasn't a great score throughout, but I did think that he did some elements here and there that, that uh, if anything was kind of lending a little more of the noirish right. tone to it, I felt like every now and then it was the music that was coming through. Mm-hmm. So that's probably fair. Sax. Yeah. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the stereotypical noir yep. ad- addition right. there. Tommy, you know somebody who worked with this movie, right? Don't you? Oh, I do. Yes. Friend of the show, Joy. Uh, she is an animal trainer for movies and television. And she trained and was the onset handler for Boots. If you remember the scene, I don't remember the name of Boots. the puppet, uh, but the one that is the actor in Happy Time that is oh, torn apart from the... By the dogs? By the dogs. <laughs> uh, Boots <laughs> is the black puggish dog. That's the one that's later brought out and Phil sees him as like, get him out of here and stuff. 
Um, and she said, <laughs> yeah, so she worked with the dogs on that scene. I actually uh, had a barbecue where Boots was at yesterday. <laughs> That's not something you needed Aww. to know. Um, anyways, um, uh, one of the th- Hopefully you weren't barbecuing Boots. Well. No. <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the things that she did say was interesting. Uh, Pete, or I'm sorry, Andy, you already uh, sort of related to it in the idea of that everything has to be hiding where the puppetry goes. That that whole, what she thought was so interesting about that whole scene that takes place on the deck with the hot tub is there's a whole area under it. That it's all fake. It's all built way up. So the puppetry, the puppeteers can be under the hot tub with their hands in. Um, But unfortunately, one of the things before I heard that story, one of the things I remember about that scene is this doesn't look like a real deck. And that really doesn't look like a real hot tub. (laughs) Now I know (laughs) the reason is because it was all made out of whole cloth. It's not a joke. Um, But uh, she said that she had a lot of fun working on the movie and um, Boots was my favorite part of the movie. The end. <laughs> Yay for pugs. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know. Is there uh, is there other things that we should say about this movie, or does it make sense for us to rank it? I mean, it does. You know, I will say I, I do like that. It, it feels out of place, honestly, but I still liked at the end of the movie, um, after the en- end of the movie, I should say, during the credits, you do see some of the behind-the-scenes work that went into it. That yeah. is just that for me, that was nice and eye opening to realize, oh, yes. man, oh, wow, this is how they were doing those things. That's what I really enjoy about Henson and and the Henson company and the way that they do their puppetry. I find it so creative. Um, but unfortunately, it just wasn't with a film that uh, that was quality. I mean, I, I went to see it uh, Friday afternoon, and I think I there were uh, maybe 10 people tops in it. I know. Right now, it's it's doing very poorly at the box office. I think it's it came in, uh, I want to say under ten million, uh, yeah, or just mm. right about ten million yeah. for its opening weekend. So it's going to no have good. a hard time um, doing much better than that. I saw it Saturday at noon, and it was a private showing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, really? Yeah, and I go to the ArcLight where oh, they intro- no. where someone at the ArcLight introduces every movie and tells you what <laughs> things are. And he went, ladies and oh. <laughs> and I was just sitting there and he goes, okay. And so he just walked up from the front and stood in front of me and was like, so you Shook excited about the movie? Yeah, it was really, it was very sweet. He was very nice about it and stuff, but his name was Mark. And we chatted for a bit because there was nobody else there. <laughs> so funny. Which honestly, if I'm saying out, if now that I'm just saying that out loud, that could have hurt my response to it. Totally. A comedy yeah, I, yeah. needs laughter, but gets laughter. But Laughter doesn't need, I mean, when that puppet in the first 10 minutes says, uh, can you spare a penny? My wife died. I guffawed like out loud. So I'm not afraid to laugh on my own, but, uh, right. yeah, but it was not a well attended show. Well, it, it, you know, it's the lowest post bridesmaid post bridesmaids opening ever for Melissa McCarthy. So, mm. uh, she's, uh, yeah, it was, it was real bottom of the barrel, unfortunately, but well, uh, it sounds like I had more people. I saw the late show on Thursday night. Actually, I went and saw it, uh, b- before the official open and I had more people than you guys, but it, in general, it wasn't, it wasn't a full theater and, and hearing about how it's progressed over the weekend, uh, doesn't sound super great for it moving forward. Um, you know, and I think we talk about flick chart hate crimes. I don't know that we're going to have a whole lot of them with this one because it's so different from movies that we usually see. Mm. Um, so m- maybe we should get into ranking it. We do this fun thing here at The Next Reel where we rank all the movies we've watched. And it's all facilitated by a fun little website called Flickchart. You can find a ranking of all the movies we've watched on the film board at flickchart.com slash TNR film board. Can you tell me how to chart, how to flick chart, happy time? He's servicing a client. That actually reminds me that uh, Sesame Street actually sued uh, STX uh, for this movie because uh, the advertising in the poster saying all Sesame, all, all, no, no Sesame, all street. Right. And uh, the, I, I think the lawsuit was rejected, but um, I, uh, I think that's funny that you bring that in. So kudos. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, first up, we have the Happy Time Murders, or everybody's favorite Tom Cruise movie, The Mummy. The Mummy. The Mummy. I I will take The Mummy over this one. The Happy Time Murders, or Forty Two. Abstain. Forty Two. Forty Two. Well, the Happy Time Murders, or Tommy's favorite train movie, Child Forty Four. <laughs> Happy Time Murders. 
Happy Time Murders for me too. Ugh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really. Wow. This is this is really hard. I'll probably say Happy Time Murders because I you know I I wouldn't put either of these on, but there you go. <laughs> the Happy Time Murders or Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit. Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit. Was that the one with Chris Pine? Yes. Happy Time Murders. Yeah, I'll say Happy Time Murders. Oh, good. I know, it surprised me. The Happy Time Murders or Murder on the Orient Express. Happy Time Murders. Murder on the Orient Express. Murder on the Orient Express. I want to see the Happy Time Murder on the Orient Express. <laughs> <laughs> if that movie was to re- be remade with puppets, I would be all in. Ah, <laughs> uh, me too, brother. Oh, the Happy Time Murders or Everest. Uh, Abstain? Everest. Everest for me. Uh, Everest for me too. Well, that lands Happy Time Murders at 59 out of 72. It actually ended up higher than I was expecting. But, uh, yeah, what are you going to do? It was that <laughs> child 44 bounce. <laughs> um, C44B. Yep. For, <laughs> for me, for my letterbox ranking, I'm going to give it a two and a dislike. I like that. I would like to do the same, please. I feel like I'm going to do a one and a half and a dislike. Snap. Got it. So it's like 1.8. So it's around two, but Something all of us right didn't there. like it, which is yeah. not happy time for there. For no. what's next for us <laughs> next month, September, where do we go from here? We are going to go out and watch The Predator <laughs> uh, coming out uh, the weekend of September 14th, I believe. Very excited to see it. Another one in that uh, thing. We talked about it a bit earlier. I think the original Predator, the Arnold Schwarzenegger film, was the first rated R movie that I ever saw. So I'm very excited to do that uh, next month in September for the main show, for the next reel. Andy, what are you guys working on? What series are you in? Uh, we just uh, did Beneath the Planet of the Apes, so our next show, we are going to be escaping from the Planet of the Apes. So we're uh, looking forward to talking about that on the show this week. And how many more Apes movies are there? I was about to ask escape? that. That's so funny. <laughs> See? <laughs> after Beneath, we have Conquest and then Battle. And then uh, then it's the big break until uh, Tim Burton and the more recent ones. But we're just covering that first five. Very cool. Very cool. Also, we wanted to tell everybody that we gather with folks on our Discord channel about a half an hour before every film board movie talk to chat a bit about how we think the film will play and do a little pre-show pep talk with all of you wonderful folks. Find out how you can join us in the conversation at thenextreel.com. Uh, and thank you, every single person out there that can hear me for hanging out with us tonight. Say goodnight, Tommy Hanson. Good night. Thank you. See you soon, Andy Nelson. Hasta la vista. The film board will be back in September, everybody, at the next reel, when the movie ends, our conversation begins. Till next.